my talk's going to have a little bit of a, a different flavor. Um, and so I'll give you guys a little bit of a background of, of kind of what we do. So my, my company was formerly known as Lightning Technologies. We were purchased back in 2012 by National Technical Systems. Uh, NTS owns all sorts of lab shakers, vibration labs, uh, thermodynamics, you know, all sorts of stuff. And uh, we're kind of a niche lab. Uh, we were we primarily have been known uh, as the group that kind of standardized the test requirements and, and how to deal with the issue of lightning. Um, statistically, an aircraft gets struck about once every thousand flight hours, um, and that's every aircraft in the world. Uh, unfortunately, we've done a really good job with the standards over the years because, as far as I'm aware, there's not many planes falling out of the sky, which for most of us here is a good thing. Now, to understand it, you really have to look at all of the various pieces of the physical phenomena that occur in the lightning environment. It's a true real world multi-physics problem. You have all of the thermal effects associated with a 10,000 degree Celsius, almost near instantaneous inflation of temperature over a very small area. You have the flow of up to 200,000 amps of current in that channel at the same time as being exposed to millions of volts per meter electric field intensities. It's insane. Now you can imagine that there are things that get struck that move, like aircraft and helicopters and anything that moves that goes in the sky, uh, and things that are stuck on the ground that are not quite so lucky. Wind turbines, buildings, golf courses, really tall buildings, and when it's struck by lightning, it's really expensive. I mean, everything that I listed there is not something that, well, maybe some of us in here might, but not me personally, can afford to do. A uh, wind turbine, for example, makes money by operating. When a wind turbine gets struck by lightning and it suffers damage, it has to stop spinning, which means it doesn't do the only thing it was designed to do, which is generate energy. So that's obviously a big impetus for customers and people that work in those industries there to prevent failures. It's a big reliability concern. And in the case of customer or commercial type aircraft, it's a safety issue. If an aircraft gets struck and it falls out of the sky or has a loss of a system, people die and that's not good. Uh, there's a lot of people here that probably remember TWA Flight 800 back in the late 90s. Um, you know, terrible tragedy there. Uh, the real cause of it there, my company participated in the uh, failure analysis of that. Really don't know. You know, you can only kind of go back and look at what you can find there. But uh, it was attributed to probably a static discharge uh, inside the fuel tank that resulted in an ignition source and the sorts of which uh, our lab has, you know, spent many years studying and, and, and testing there. So. Uh, you can see some really interesting pictures here of the effects of uh, lightning on stuff. Uh, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, that is a wind turbine that is not having a good day. You can see the uh, center picture there uh, is somebody that had a really fortunate uh, camera to capture this lightning strike to an aircraft. And the results of something like striking an old-style aircraft, an old propeller aircraft that's predominantly fiberglass and wood. Obviously, we have newer ones here. Um, so from a design standpoint, how do you deal with lightning? Well, you know, you ask me, the guy that does this for a living, I say, do it when it's on paper. It's really cheap to take your pencil out and erase a design and start something differently. But unfortunately, we're only one part of the certification process. So the FAA says that you have to deal with lightning and fatigue and EMI and HERF and all sorts of issues. And of course, for us, lightning is only one pole in that entire tent there. So what we do is, well, we publish standards. There's committees and there's rules making organizations that serve to try to De decomplicate these types of issues there. So there's things like surface protections. Uh, metallic meshes are a very popular use there. You can co-cure them with your carbon laminates if you have a composite structure. That does uh, a great phenomenon called arc root dispersion, where you have a lightning channel that comes down, and instead of attaching to a single point, it finds many fibers in the area or bumps in the mesh, and it fans out. Very good thing, less current density. Uh, you also have inline circuit protection mechanisms there to say, well, Hmm, my device is designed to tolerate 300 volts. Well, uh, in the event of lightning strike, you're going to see 3,000 volts. Well, that's not really a good thing. And there's clamping mechanisms, transorbs, varistors that you can use. Um, and sealants are great, um, especially in fuel tanks. And there's a lot of really common types of uh, protection measures that you can put in that are really easy to do up front. But how do you quantify that risk? How do you know that you need to put in these protection mechanisms? If you're going to build an aircraft, you want to sell a lot of them. You don't want to sell just one. So if you add $10,000 in cost to it over the lifetime of an aircraft program, that's billions of dollars. Not to mention the loss of range from the addition of weight, possibly aerodynamic impacts, range limitations. Not good. Uh, anybody that's in an aerospace type engineer there is going to agree with me there and say that that's, uh, that's not a good thing. So really the question that has always faced our industry is, what do you do? How do you fix this issue? 
Well, before we would have to, you know, rely on companies like ours. We've been around for the better part of four decades now. We have a really deep uh, library and encyclopedia of things we've seen. People would just ask us what we think, and that's probably a good dart to throw at the wall. But you don't want to stake a design on that. So ultimately, you have to go and validate several designs and kind of pick the best one there and just kind of live with spending $100 million to certify one design of an aircraft. So to do that, you have to go through your entire design process. And I'm going to purposely belabor this so you understand how awful it really is, you know, from, from my standpoint, seeing customers have to go through that. To get to a test like this, so this is a, a common type of initial leader attachment test, we call it, where we expose a scale model, a metallic scale model, uh, to the high voltage electric fields that are commonly seen in, in uh, ambient lightning in, in the sky there. And the goal with this is to see where the different areas that lightning is going to attach to. And that's a process that we call lightning zoning. Uh, it's a requirement for certification to know that, well, there's different amounts of current that occur different times during the lightning discharge cycles and different uh, waveforms, if you would like to call them that. And to get to that point, to get to even this scale model here, you have to have a design. You have to have gone through and done your aerodynamics. You have to know where your engines are going to be. You have to have sized everything. That is not a short duration time period there. So before the advent of multi-physics and before the industry you know, as a whole really started to take part of this, you had to do everything manually. Um, so this is a test of a wing from a major aircraft manufacturer. Uh, this is one that I personally, actually I took this picture. Um, you have to take an entire wing and we have to climb around on the inside of it there and we have to inject scaled lightning currents through a generator in a one end, take into account all of the various measurement challenges there, coupling to the coaxial cables on your measurement devices and low signal to noise ratios, high signal to noise ratios, everything that have to do with that stuff. And uh, how bad would it be to go through and build this wing and then find out you can't certify it or it's not safe? You're, you're at the stage of this slide here. It's terrible. It's not very cool. Um, and the other side of it is, what happens if you don't do that engineering work up front and you kind of wing it, or maybe you, you, you think you understand it, and you get to uh, the certification aspect of it there, and this is what happens. So here's a couple of cool pictures. I always like to, to throw these in here. So uh, the one, the really concerning one is the one on the left there. Um, that's the, uh, that is, well, I guess it's on my right, but probably your guy's left. Uh, that is a joint inside of a fuel tank. And so uh, especially for the aviation administration, uh, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on fuel tank protection. Obviously, it's ignitable. It's a, it's a very flammable mixture there. It's how your aircraft flies. If you uh, have more than 200 microjoules of energy in an arc or a spark or an ignition source of any type, it's considered a failure, and it's enough to ignite the entire fuel tank. And so you can imagine that's probably not a good thing there. And so uh, this was a fairly well thought out design. Um, you can see uh, on one of the ones that didn't blow up, uh, there's some sealants there. So they put some effort in, in, in an attempt to uh, circumvent doing all this engineering work. But uh, unfortunately, still not good enough. So what do they do? Back to the drawing board. That sets their program back about eight months. This is a, a specific case there, about eight months. Uh, they incurred several million dollars in penalties from delays to customers and really not a fun thing. Um, some of these are uh, easier to test than others. The upper image here is a wind turbine that we tested. It... Uh, there was a, a litigation lawsuit that we participated in where somebody was making some repairs when they shouldn't have, and they were on what they thought was an insulating ladder. Um, and rather than doing something which all of us would say is probably an easy multi-physics simulation, you know, a 20-minute gig in Comsol, uh, some guy just went out there and did it, and come to find out you don't have enough insulation in your ladder. And that's what the top one shows. And the bottom one was a conducted current test on an internal circuit component. Uh, it's obviously coming from a light. Uh, and so this light was exposed to a direct attachment to a lightning uh, to the lighting environment there. And rather than conducting all of the currents down the cables like they intended, their glass depressurized and sent particles all over our lab, which we had to clean up. Uh, just another couple cool pictures. Um, you know, we get to, we get to play with some really, really complicated physics in real life here. Um, you know, the generator that's in the left image or on the right image on your guys' side there, that's our 24 stage Marx generator. It's uh, 2.4 million volts we can charge up to. Um, and it produces some really flashy imagery here. So you can see a couple pictures of a wind turbine blade and a, an aircraft here. Uh, but we call that the test first based approach. It's a very risky uh, approach. And even if you are able to go through that aspect there, you can't test everything inside of an aircraft. How many different joints are there? How many different connections and fasteners and possible defects? You know, even machines make mistakes. 
uh, you can't know everything. And so some people sleep better than others. They're, they're, people are more comfortable with that. Well, not for me. Uh, it needs to be absolute, especially in the case of flight safety. There, there's no substitute for it there. So uh, back in the late 90s, uh, calculations started becoming available. People started to really understand the lightning environment a lot more. Uh, there's some analytical waveforms, if you'd like to call them that, that they use to represent the various aspects of the lightning uh, environment there. But unfortunately, in SPICE, if it's not explicitly included, it is not part of the model. And uh, you can't really take into account field coupling and thermal effects and stuff. So it's a back of the napkin. It's better than nothing. But it's certainly not sufficient to design an entire aircraft on. That's insane. And of course, in the lightning environment, uh, everything happens really, really fast. We're talking microseconds. Um, and of course, in, you know, we use Maxwell's equations uh, as part of our full wave uh, field simulations here that we do to uh, approximate and, and calculate these values. Uh, we have a way to do that, but you can't really do that in SPICE. And so really there was no bridge for that until the advent of multiphysics. And so uh, we kind of brought ComSol into our facility. I started working with it back when I was in college, so I've been working with it now for about 10 years. And um, it's, it's a very powerful tool. So you get a lot of stuff that, that you know, I have to... to not really account for you get it for free it's a really uh it's a really nice tool because uh capacitive effects are geometry based inductive effects are largely geometry based so if i build my geometry correctly i don't have to pay attention to that stuff it's going to calculate the effects of those for me provided that of course my input parameters and everything are realistic and uh everything that goes into building a model like that so again you know you have your mesh and all that other kind of stuff uh, so if you're able to represent the most of the dominant coupling physics, the resistive effects, the inductive effects, and capacitive effects, the onus on you as the person building the model only comes down to putting the right values in. So how do you do that? Well, you can build a little coupon, and you can measure resistances. You can measure voltage drops along carbon composite panels. It's not very difficult. A lot easier than building an airplane, an engine, anything like that. And, of course, as you get to larger scales, such as big 3D models, I think... Um, one of the models that you'll see a picture of shortly here, I think it's about 340 million degrees of freedom. Uh, and it was it was quite large and uh, they take a long time to solve, but uh, it's necessary, of course. And uh, of course, you do have the ability to iterate through design flaws, manufacturing issues. And uh, that's really the best way that we can approximate the real world in the field of electromagnetics is, is Maxwell's equations at the large scale there. So um, we've done it for a number of projects. The uh, wing that you see here is actually a model of the wing that I showed the picture of where we did the testing on. And rather than having to do testing on every version of that wing, uh, we went in and built a multi-physics model of it there. Um, and we use this to do uh, what we call sub-modeling there. So we look at the large-scale current flows, and we calculate them at specific locations. And then we build sub-models where we use the calculated current flows in a specific area as the stimuli to a smaller model. And that allows us to avoid having to put ridiculously high aspect ratio, you know, mesh elements and, and crazy, crazy high fidelity pieces into our large models while without sacrificing the accuracy of accounting for that. And so we do this as an iterative process. And it's been something that's been very effective for us. Uh, this model here actually was one of the first ones that was ever used as a certification basis um, for the FAA. And so they put it under quite a bit of scrutiny there. Um, and so in layman's terms, that means that the data that came out of our model is what they use to prove whether or not an aircraft was safe for flight. Um, and that's kind of a really cool thing. And so uh, we use that in conjunction with testing, which is a big, you know, hot button topic called validation. You know, how do you know your model is correct? Well, of course, uh, you have to test it at some point. But if you eat that cost up front, you don't have to do it again later, provided that you have similar uh, geometries and materials and such. So, uh, you know, in here now that we have a model, we have a live data set. You know, we don't really have to go through and, and think about anything anymore now that we've had a sufficiently uh, diverse set of data to validate the model on. So you want to change a valve, how much current that valve going to see? Well, I can go in and I can tell you right here. That one's going to see 55 amps, and this is the typical energy if you integrate your current waveform here. Uh, this one's going to see 110, and so that gives you design level detail that you can make at your desk without having to go and find the aircraft. Um, and the real thing that we've found it to be particularly useful for is the stuff that you can't measure. You can't go in real life and take an accurate voltage measurement in between two points in a really fast duration waveform with a ton of current going through a, prop, a propeller shaft, such as this case here, um, and expect to get any realistic data. You're, you're, you're a much better engineer than I am, and I'd like for you to come work for me if you can do that. Um, so in this case here, this is a, a very, very common uh, engine model um, that we validated with uh, some very... Uh, laboring testing here. And uh, this is a magnetic sensor. And so 
this project involved trying to figure out the risk that the sensor uh, that the arrow there is pointing to, the really tiny guy there, uh, is it going to see an arc? Is there enough voltage developing in the gap between that sensor and the rotating ring to produce an arc or potentially produce one? And, uh, you know, at sea level, it's about 30,000 volts per centimeter to um, uh, cause an ionization or a breakdown of the air gap there. And uh, that means, well, uh, if you have a one millimeter gap, that is 3,000 volts, and this is about 11,000 volts. So, yeah, you you're probably have some sort of an issue there. And that is design level detail that you can make decisions on and say, well, we need to evaluate. Is this sensor going to be damaged? Is this something that uh, is an issue? Is it even an issue? How much current's going to flow? Well, we can then put a, uh, a perfect electrical conductor between that and the ring and say, how much current's going to flow if it's a perfect connection? Makes it a lot easier. And then you can get really crazy and do stuff um, like this one. So this is the uh, largest model that we've ever built personally. This one is a 65 meter wind turbine blade that um, for unfortunate reasons, uh, you have to take data and explain it to non-technical folks. I'm sure a lot of us here uh, are very familiar with that piece of it there. So rather than using symmetry, because this blade is absolutely identical down the center and having to answer, well, where's the other half of the blade? Every single time I talk about it, we had to explicitly include it. So that's a... Uh, that's not a particularly fun one, but unfortunately, you do have to live with that from time to time here. And so uh, this involved uh, a straightening. This is a wind turbine blade uh, without the fiberglass casing on it. And uh, the exterior layer there is 250 microns thick and 65 meters long. So that's a, uh, that was a very hefty, hefty uh, meshing exercise that took, uh, took quite some time to it. But we were able to get through it. And uh, we went out and took that exact pro that exact blade after we modeled it. So we did not model it after before we tested it. So uh, we weren't basing it on test data. We based it on physics and then went and tested it afterwards. And and you know uh, when you have the physics correct and you understand your materials well um, in the process that I just described, uh, where you take some materials, you say, okay, this is the conductivity of my carbon in the x direction or the y direction or the x y or x x or whatever orientation you're interested in and you quantify it, you can put it in there and if you understand the you know very basics of how many mesh elements you need to accurately resolve something, you get a really good approximation of real life. And, and this is in a crazy, crazy complicated environment that even in the lab you have trouble reproducing that environment. Uh, and so, you know, in short, you know, we've really kind of pushed the industry, at least in the, the lightning side there, to, to leverage this wherever possible. Um, you can only conjecture things to a degree from, uh, you know, the, the types of things that you've experienced. You can only look back and say, uh, I believe this is going to happen if you've seen it before. And, and unfortunately, I don't think anyone's ever been inside of a fuel tank when it's, you know, been struck by lightning. So uh, that's probably a good thing. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be in there. Probably smells bad. And uh, you, but now you don't have to worry about that. You can uh, evaluate design alternatives. You can predict the things that are going to happen, and you can understand: is this a risk or is this not a risk? Well, earlier in the design process, there. So uh, you can look at the big picture. You can look at the little picture. You can look at whatever size problem that you want, provided that you have the right resources and you know what you're doing, and, and all of those types of issues. Uh, and so we're starting to rely a lot more on this. And, um, you know, my group, we probably, I have four full-time guys under me that, that do exclusively multi-physics modeling. And these are, we don't sell anything. You know, our, our company is a, a consulting organization and we do testing. And so, you know, other people have to do the uh, issue that Freddie brought up of coming up with the ideas. So uh, we, we let somebody else do that and they just bring them to us. And then we, you know, kind of run our numbers there. So uh, you can leverage similarity too. That's one that's um, a really big one in our industry. Nobody wants to do anything new. They want to leverage, you know, the, all the stuff that they've done in this previous product, and uh, try to keep it the same. So if you have a good, you know, good modeling techniques, we can actually quantify the effects of lightning in a, a really powerful way without having to blow everything up. And uh, that's it for me.